Okay, let's put them all together. We're going to draw what's called a ventricular function curve. And we're going to draw multiple ventricular function curves because in reality, a ventricular function curve is a whole family of curves. Now, treat the solid purple line as the norm. Notice the axes. Left ventricular end diastolic pressure. I could put something else on that axis. Can you tell me what that would be? You're right. Right atrial pressure, CVP, pulmonary wedge pressure, left ventricular end diastolic volume, left atrial pressure. All of these are indices of preload. On the y-axis, we have stroke volume. That's our index of tension. But we could put cardiac output, peak systolic pressure. We could put systolic performance. All of these are applicable. And now what we see is what's called a ventricular function curve. But in reality, it's a whole family of curves because it brings together contractility, afterload, and preload. If the solid line is normal, then moving up and to the left would be an increase in contractility or a decrease in afterload. Those are illustrated by the arrows. So the arrows indicate an increased contractility or decreased afterload. If afterload goes up or contractility falls, then the Frank-Starling curve moves down. Each curve is a Frank-Starling curve. They're a family of curves. So if contractility goes down or afterload goes up, then this Frank-Starling curve gets pushed down as illustrated by the arrows. It's a family of curves. Notice what it shows. Let's start at this preload. In the normal scenario, we'll get about that much stroke volume. Let's say that represents approximately 60 mils. Well, if I start from the same preload, but I increase contractility, then I increase stroke volume. So by increasing the inotropic state, for any given preload, I get a greater ejection. That's an increased contractility. I move to another line. I still have a Frank-Starling curve. So Frank-Starling is still very viable. It's just a different curve. The entire curve got shifted. By the same token, if afterload falls, then I get a greater ejection. There's less load for the heart to work against, so it ejects more. Woohoo! Yeah! We like that. Less, less work, eject more. Contrast that with any curve below that in which contractility fell. And if contractility falls, notice that the stroke volume falls. That's the dashed black line underneath the solid black line. I get the same scenario if afterload goes up. So if afterload goes up or contractility goes down, I suppress or I push down and to the right the Frank-Starling curve. Frank-Starling represents, represents the length-tension relationship. We have a whole multitudes of curves representing Frank-Starling depending upon the level of contractility and the level of afterload. Remember, Tip your cap to the ventricle for keeping you alive. Contractility, afterload, and preload. All right, let's apply this to USMLE step one. We have two different curves here, a blue line and a purple line. First thing we're going to do is we're going to say N, this point N, represents the normal point. Notice, if I move down the blue line to A, so I move from N to A, this means a decrease in performance because of a decrease in preload. X-axis is preload. Remember, we can put a whole variety of things there. Right atrial pressure, left atrial pressure, CVP, pulmonary wedge pressure, left ventricular end diastolic volume, etc. Bottom line, that is preload. So a movement from N to A represents a reduced performance because of a reduced preload, Frank Starling. A movement from N to B 
represents an increased performance due to an increase in preload. Again, Frank Starling. So this is going to be the big key when we're going to analyze these graphs for USMLE Step 1. We just ask ourselves two questions. We're going to analyze and say, number one, what happened to preload? Number two, what happened to performance? If preload and performance go in the same direction, then there's a Frank Starling involved. I'll stop, let you think about that, then I'll repeat. If preload and performance go in the same direction, so in other words, from N to B, or from N to A, Notice that preload and performance are going the same direction. Then we know there's a Frank Starling mechanism involved. So that's what we're going to do when we do some challenges or some questions related to this figure. Now, notice we have another, just like we indicated on the previous slide, we have a family of curves. So the purple line shows C, D, and E. All right, it's another curve. It's another Frank Starling curve. So if I go from C to E or C to D, notice that preload and performance go in the same direction. Since preload and performance are going in the same direction, this is a Frank Starling mechanism. So the purple line represents just simply a different, a different Frank Starling curve. They're a family of curves. But we're at a different level of contractility or afterload on the purple line than the blue line. So something has changed to alter the Frank Starling relationship. We have shifted it up. But moving up and down, in other words, C to D, I'll repeat, C to D or C to E represents a Frank Starling mechanism. These are simply two. Frank Starling curves. Okay, let's work with these curves. We have what are drawn in there are called vectors. We have one, two, three, and four. We'll start with vector number one. Notice what vector number one does. We go from N to D. We ask ourselves our two questions. Number one, what happened to preload? Hopefully you see preload went down. Number two, what happened to performance? Absolute level of performance. Going from N to D, to D says a decrease in performance. So preload went down, performance went down. This is a Frank Starling mechanism. So the initial event, and we have to do it in this order like this, in order to determine what the initial event was. So the initial event is a drop in preload. All right, performance decreased because of a loss of preload. This loss of preload means a loss of venous return. This causes a reduction in cardiac output and causes a reflex sympathetic stimulation to the heart. So notice that contractility went up. So here we lost some preload but we had a reflex increase in contractility. This increase in contractility partially compensates for the loss in preload. Notice, if it were just a pure loss of preload, we'd go from N to A. We have much lower performance at A than we do D. So the initial event was a loss in preload, and then a reflex increase in contractility trying trying to compensate for the loss in preload. So there again, the initial event here is a reduction in preload. And we know it's Frank Starling because preload and performance go in the same direction. Now we think, we stop, we think, we analyze, we keep approaching things as it's going to happen on USMLE Step 1. How can I get a reduction in preload? Well, big one to look for on step one will be hemorrhage. Others will be venodilators. You could add in standing upright. 
any kind of volume loss from the vasculature. It doesn't necessarily have to be hemorrhage. It could be diuretic abuse. It could be vomiting. It could be diarrhea. So we put hemorrhage, that's actually, you know, blood loss. But anything that reduces vascular volume is going to reduce preload. Because as we will discuss later, there's a direct relationship between preload and vascular volume. So again, key thing to do, ask yourself, number one, what happened to preload? Number two, what happened to performance? If they go the same direction, the initial event is Frank Starling. And then just think about ways that they could assess you. In this example, loss of preload, how could you lose preload? Clinical vignettes. You're thinking clinical vignettes. Oh, patient had diarrhea for four days. Huh? We're thinking decreased preload because of loss of vascular volume. All right, vector number two. We're going to ask ourselves two questions, same two questions. Going from N to F. N to F. Notice, preload went up, but performance went down. So they didn't go in the same direction. Preload went up, but performance went down. So because they didn't go in the same direction, we know this is not a Frank Starling. Frank Starling is not the initial event. What happened here is a reduction in contractility. All right, this is a loss of contractility. Because preload and performance did not go in the same direction, we know it's not a Frank Starling event. This decrease in contractility will decrease ejection fraction, which in turn means increased preload. Stating that another way, if I don't pump out as much, then the pump's going to back up. Think about your sink. Does your sink ever back up? If you're not able to drain it out, and pumping it out is kind of like draining your sink. If I can't pump it out, then things back up. So the sink backs up. So if contractility falls, I'm going to see an immediate increase in preload. Very important thing for USMLE Step 1. What, what are our measurements for preload? CVP, right atrial pressure, pulmonary wedge pressure. If those variables go up, one of the First things you put on your differential, not saying it's the correct answer, but you put it on your differential. If preload's going up, that could mean the pump is failing. Big point. Now, this increase in preload will help partially compensate, but nonetheless, we have more preload and less performance. There is a decrease in contractility. All right, now we start to think about on step one, what are going to be some examples, clinical vignettes where we lose contractility? Classic will be congestive heart failure. Can you think of any others? Like myocardial ischemia, like beta blockers. Remember, beta, beta 1, increases contractility. So if I give a beta blocker, I could decrease contractility, and hopefully when I say beta blockers, you start thinking of names of beta blockers, like propranolol. Hopefully you've got more in your mind. So ischemia, rapid loss, acidosis will also decrease contractility, beta blockers. These are some of the things to look for, cues in clinical vignettes, and you're thinking immediately loss in contractility. And if I'm losing contractility, Preload's going up. Now, an acute increase in afterload will produce the exact same change. Now, remember, afterload is TPR. So if I get a marked peripheral arteriolar vasoconstriction, this will increase afterload and look and look exactly like a decrease in contractility on a ventricular function curve. In other words, you go from N to F. Hopefully you remember that alpha causes arteriolar vasoconstriction. You can stop a heart cold if you OD somebody on a drug like phenylephrine, an alpha agonist, because there's just too much afterload. So again, moving from N to F is a loss in contractility and or an increase in afterload. And again, peripheral vasoconstriction. 
All right, vector three, we go from in toward vector three. I'm still going to ask the same two questions. Preload. Preload went down. Performance went up. Preload went down. Performance went up. So they didn't go in the same direction. So this is not Frank Starling. This is an increase in contractility. Okay, I got greater performance at a lower preload. That is an increase in contractility. Okay, performance went up, preload went down. It's an increase in contractility, increased the ejection fraction. I'm pumping more blood out, so preload goes down. So I know this is not Frank Starling. This is an increase in performance outside of Frank Starling. This is an increase in contractility. And again, think about your things. Think about things that are going to cause an increase in contractility that are going to show up on clinical vignettes or experimental vignettes on step one. Hopefully you said beta agonists like norepinephrine, epinephrine, dobutamine, isopaterenol. Could also give dopamine. Hopefully you said drugs like digoxin, which is a sodium potassium ATPase blocker. And enamorinone and milrinone, as we indicated before, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now we'll get the exact same shift if afterload goes down. Now remember, vector 2 was an increase in afterload, so I got less ejection. Vector 3 is if afterload goes down, then ejection goes up. So... Movement from N to 3 could be an acute increase in contractility or a decrease in afterload. So in other words, peripheral arteriolar vasodilation. Afterload again is TPR. All right, vector number 4 is our last vector. I'm still going to ask myself the same two questions. Never deviate. Preload, performance. Notice. Going from N to vector 4 shows an increased preload and an increase in performance. Preload and performance went the same direction. Therefore, I know this is a Frank Starling mechanism. So the initial event, the initial thing that changed, was an increase in venous return causing an increase in preload to the heart. The increase in preload increased performance. Since performance went up, cardiac output went up. Because cardiac output goes up, that means blood pressure goes up. And if blood pressure goes up, then sympathetic activity to the heart goes down. So this represents an increase in preload and a reflex decrease in contractility. Remember, if I decrease sympathetic stimulation, I'm going to reduce contractility. Moving to vector 4 from N is an increased preload. That's the initial event with a reflex decrease in contractility. We did not stay on the blue line. We moved below the blue line, indicating a decrease in contractility. If there were no change in contractility, then we would move from N to B, N to B, but we didn't. We're now at a point below B, but we still have elevated performance because of elevated preload. So once again, this is an increased preload causing an increase in performance with a reflex decrease in sympathetic outflow. Now we keep thinking for step one, what could cause an increase in preload? What could we put in clinical vignettes, experimental vignettes that would increase preload? Well, hopefully you said the opposite things of what we indicated when we went on vector one, in which we decrease preload. These will just be the opposite. We volume load. We add volume, increases preload. Previously, we said how do we decrease it? We lose volume, hemorrhage, diarrhea, etc. Well, to increase preload, you can volume load. You can also just lie down. Standing upright decreases preload. Lying down increases preload. And another one you might want to put in the back of your mind for step one, 
is going into space, zero gravity. Zero gravity is well known to increase preload. All right, one of the ways and the reason, one of the ways that you may be assessed is illustrated on these graphs, but the reason that you have to take the approach I just suggested was look at vector 2 versus vector 4. Both of these show a decreased contractility, but they're markedly different causes for them. Remember, vector 2 was simply a decrease in contractility. The initial event was a decrease in contractility ischemia of the heart. So I reduced contractility that caused preload to go up and performance to go down. More specifically, performance went down, which backed up the system to cause an increase in preload. However, vector 4 has less contractility, but there's less contractility because we had a reflex change in sympathetic outflow. The initial event was a Frank Starling mechanism. And that's how we can differentiate. So if I were to give you, or they give you a graph like this on step one, and they show vector four, do not pick beta blocker. Do not pick myocardial ischemia. Pick zero G. That would be a correct answer. But myocardial ischemia is incorrect. Ischemia is correct for vector two. It's a possibly correct answer. Beta blockers for vector 2. But we could no longer say volume loading for vector 2. That would be incorrect because that's vector 4. And that's why if we ask the two simple questions, what happened to preload, what happened to performance? If they go in the same direction, the first event is Frank Starling. If they go in opposite direction, then it's a change in contractility or a change in afterload. Okay, ventricular volumes for step one. In diastolic volume, we already mentioned that. Volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole, that's preload. And then, of course, end systolic volume, the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of systole. The difference in these is stroke volume. Because remember, stroke volume is the volume of blood ejected per beat. So therefore, stroke volume is in diastolic minus in systolic. In other words, what you start with minus what you end with. That's what in diastolic and in systolic are. Don't forget ejection fraction. Calculate it. Stroke volume divided by in diastolic volume. What fraction of the total got ejected? That's the way, maybe if you remember it that way, it'll help you to remember the basic equation. I know we all love equations. Uh, maybe we don't, but that's a way to help you remember. Ejection fraction is simply what fraction got ejected. It's the amount ejected divided by what I start with. Normal ejection fraction is around 60 to 65 percent. So, in other words, anything greater than 55. We start getting a little concerned if ejection fraction falls below 55 percent. 